everyone. Welcome back to the Going Scared podcast. This is your host, Jessica Honiger, founder of the socially impact fashion brand, Noonday Collection. Are you ready for honest and vulnerable conversations that will inspire you towards action? Join me here every week for conversations on living lives of purpose by leaving comfort and going scared. Today, I am sitting down with our guest, Heather Land. I discovered Heather's hilarious video series titled, I Ain't Doing It on Instagram this summer. And I immediately sat down with my kids and binged on all of them. They're also on YouTube and on Facebook. In the video series, she pokes fun at everything from group texting to making fun of the people that take too long to order in front of us in the drive throughs And then she wraps up each series saying something like, I would rather bathe in tobacco spit than be added to another group text in her amazing Southern accent. You guys, can we just make laughter a part of our daily habits? You know, I mean, self-care, we talk a lot about silence and meditation, which by the way, I've got a podcast coming out on that. And it's something I'm radically committed to. My time alone in solitude and silence with God is saving my life right now. But you know what else? Laughter. We've got to laugh. And sometimes I'm just poking around trying to find something to make me laugh. Well, listen, she will do the job for you. But as you're also going to hear today, she's not afraid to talk about the harder things in life like addiction and divorce. I'm excited for you guys to dive on into this conversation. And by the way, if you enjoy this conversation at all, would you go leave a review on iTunes? If you just go leave a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts, just tell me a little bit about what Going Scared has meant to you. More people will find it, more people will hear about it, and more people will get to participate in conversations like this one. Okay, so were you that kid that always had to sit right by the teacher's desk for the entire year? (laughs) Everybody asked me that if I was a class clown. And the answer is a no. Now, I did not make like uber excellent grades because I didn't really care. But uh, I was very social. I had a lot of friends, but I was really um, sweet and I loved to please people. And so I never try to rock the boat too much. I had, I tried to be respectful, you know, of, of my teachers. And, um, so yeah, I think I was too conscientious to get myself into, uh, too much hot water. So yeah, it was a little bit opposite. I was more, a little more introverted growing up. Um, Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I know, and we're going to talk about this, but your whole series, I Ain't Doing It, became a phenomenon. And now you've written a book. And my kids and I just binged on uh, I Ain't Doing It. One day, we just (laughs) went to your Instagram account and just watched every single one. And I'm like texting all my friends. And they're just so good. And oh my gosh, if we all just took time every day to laugh. I mean, that's the gift of what you have to give. Laughter should be right up there with brushing your teeth, you know? And I mean, I can get through some days without having laughed. So just, I'm an Instagram girl. I know that you started on Snapchat, right? And right. then pr- have Facebook too, but I found you via Instagram. So wherever you are, go follow Heather Landis mm. right now. And it's it's so good. It's so funny. But so you grew up as more of a rule follower. Do you think some of that, did you kind of grow up, obviously you grew up in the South. Did What was sort of your idea of what a woman should be? Yeah. So I don't necessarily think it's just the South that bred yeah. this into me. I think it was also a uh, family dynamic and religious dynamic and a lot of things, but women were definitely, uh, you know, played the lesser role. Um, you know, I grew up playing with dolls and I just, all I ever wanted to do was, you know, grow up and marry a preacher, which I did and I'm divorced. And so that didn't go well, but, you know, I think we grow up with this ideal of, what uh, womanhood is supposed to look like. And I think it has become more, um, or at least when I was growing up, it was more of a modern day version of, uh, you know, the old days, right? Uh, mm. All the all the commercials and, and uh, movies that, that depicted women with their aprons on and in the kitchen and barefoot and pregnant. And I think that was sort of, yeah, it was, that was a little bit of my ideal. Um, I have since quite evolved 
<laughs> and you don't have enough time in this podcast uh, to hear all my uh, comments about it. But that was definitely on my radar. I just want to grow up, be a wife, uh, learn how to cook, you know, and, and take care of babies. And that's the way every woman around me was. Yeah, it's all I knew. Yeah. See, I didn't grow up wanting that, but all the women around me, that's what they were. Yeah. And so when I began to want other things, I didn't know how to do that. Mm. And so I don't really think I found, you know, my career, my calling, my purpose, um, until my late 30s, which is when I started Noonday Collection. And I know you are relatively new in stepping into being this performing comedian. Yeah. Um, has there been any looking back and thinking, gosh, if I, you know, I know um, Sheryl Sandberg, I think it's Sheryl Sandberg has this quote where, where she says, we can't become what we don't see. Yeah. Do you think if you had had someone to see would you have become differently? Um, please don't let me forget what you just asked me because I want to say this first. Um, speaking yes. of your Noonday collection, I just want to thank you for all the beautiful jewelry that you sent me. And yes. I wanted to let you know that uh, I ordered the, um, I think it's the Terrazzo, the three yes. earrings set just this morning and I'm just obsessed. And I oh, just want to thank you and tell you how much I love it and appreciate it. Um, but to answer your question, I'm on track here. Um, of course, if I think I had a different uh, example, would I have, you know, chosen a, a different uh, path along the way? Of course, absolutely. I think that's probably true for all of us. Um, and, and let me just kind of back up and say that, you know, I wasn't raised, uh, you know, on some commune. Like it wasn't like uber weird you know, growing up, like women did have jobs. It was yeah, yeah. like, you know, not everybody uh, ironed their husband's underwear. It wasn't quite like that. Um, but yes, I do think there was a bend toward um, you grow up, you let a man take care of you. You're the weaker of the two sexes. Um, and of course, if I had a different dynamic, that would have, uh, yeah, my my viewpoint would not be as such or would not have been as such. And I also think, you know, if I could be really candid here, um, you know, I grew up with uh, addiction in my home. And mm -hmm. I think that really threw my whole dynamic off of just people and relationships and even who I who I was, you know, I was raised uh, to be an enabler and to be codependent. And I had to really mm -hmm. work out of a lot of that. And but the truth is, I'm so grateful for it at this point in my life because were it not for that, there's no way I'd be funny. Like I've had to to use comedy so that I don't end up in the fetal position. So I'm really grateful for kind of the way I was brought up because I think it's played into who I am now. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I don't normally look back and with regret. I'm just I'm a seven on the Enneagram. It's like all forward moving forward thinking, but right. I have wondered like, okay, if I had had like a CEO of a business or someone, or the, even that business was this option for impact, mm -hmm. you know, I wonder if I could have found this earlier. Cause I think if, if I have any regrets, which I don't, I'm not someone who lives with regrets. This is a weird thing. I've the whole new side I'm showing on this podcast. Um, but I have wondered, like, could I have found this a little bit mm. earlier? You know, well, in, but you know the thing life. is about that. If you would have found it earlier, you might not. Uh, your your viewpoint would be different. The way you manage would be different. The way you love people would be different. So, you know, I dare say you may have started earlier, but you may not be internally where you are now. That's um, so true. You know, so I think you have to just like really embrace, uh, you know, that time as learning time and not yeah. as wasted space. You know, because right, you're where right. you are because of what you've been through. So absolutely, yeah, you're right. No regrets, you know. How do you think that has influenced your, just your material that you're able to share now? Yeah. Well, if you want to know the, <laughs> the truth, this uh, podcast and that comment that I just made is really the first time I've ever publicly said that I was raised in addiction. I talk about it in my second book. I just turned in the manuscript last week. Wow. Um, and so I, I talk about it there, but I, you know, I told you I was a people pleaser growing up and I really have just now, maybe in the past decade, and it's been a slow decade uh, where this is concerned, but I've just now started really living my life for me 
and mm-hmm. and my family, my kids, and and trying to be more concerned with my own heart and my own life, uh, because that's all I can really control, you know. So I think I've finally gotten to a point where, you know, I I've never wanted to shame anyone. I still don't. It's not in my heart to do. Mm-hmm. But this is a part of my story, and it is a it's a huge part of my story, and not a lot of people know it. So. My hope is really that um, in the coming months or years, uh, whether it's through my writing or my comedy, that I can really um, laugh about it. Um, mm-hmm. Not that addiction is no laughing matter for sure, but you know I've got some stories that are hilarious, and I've got yeah. some you know things that have come out of it that are funny. And I also hope that it can be um, just an encouragement to anybody else who's grown up in it yes. or is dealing with it currently. That you know what, it is not pretty. Um, and it is formidable. I mean, it makes us who we are, but that's yes. also a beautiful thing, you know? And so I'm just hoping to really shed light on maybe the good parts uh, of living that life. Yeah. So, so you're my guinea pig here. I didn't know I was wow. going to say that, but here we are. Keep it in. Don't edit it out. <laughs> Let, let's actually talk about that because your first book really comes from I Ain't Doing It and um a, just your hilarium and just making fun of life and sort of these everyday things that we can relate to. So what's been the process of this second book? Um, and especially while you're in the middle of launching a book and being out on tour, and now you're kind of opening up some closets, what's that been like to perform and then go home and deal with some rough stuff that takes a lot of courage to deal with? Right. Uh, you know, and that's oh, it's such a uh... Gosh, it's such an onion to to peel mm. um, that question, but it's a lot. Yeah, I mean, just I, I think that's probably what's pushing me to uh, to not live in the dark with it anymore because I'm mm-hmm. just going. I can't. I can't manage all this. <laughs> Who can right. live under this pressure? You know, I I have to just uh, you know. I, yeah, I'm writing a book. I've got kids to raise. I'm trying to write a stand up set. Like I can't be. Consumed. Giving energy to yeah. my past. Right. It's well, it it's, it's not even to my past. It's to my present, <clears throat> but it's not mine to weed through anymore. You know, I have mm. my own. I have little little people that are counting on me. Um, so I'm having to refocus. But uh, writing book two, I mean, I had to have help on this one. My goodness, I just my oh, brain yeah. is so spent. I've got a, a very close friend that's that's been helping me with the process. But even book number two. Um, it still follows that same vein uh, of I ain't doing it. You know, the Mm -hmm. chapters read kind of as standalone essays with some inspiration. Book two is, is similar, um, obviously still silly and funny. Um, but I just felt like my readers needed one more, um, really, you know, just, um, comedic uh book on their shelf uh they needed a volume two of that so that's right um, yeah it's still it's still similar in nature um but like I said I think that moving forward yeah I think you know and here's the truth I say this all the time on tour but people really when you start talking about your life they don't really care about your rainbows and unicorns right they Mm -hmm. don't want to hear how everything's awesome they want to hear how they can relate to you And so I feel like I can't, uh, take this platform in vain. You know, I have Mm -hmm. to do something good with it. And so I feel like for the reader who is really wanting to know more, yeah, I think moving forward, I'm going to, I'm going to give it to them. So, um, yeah, I appreciate the encouragement. I think uh, if it doesn't go well, we'll revisit this combo, but (laughs) you know, I I think that's what, uh, I think that's the way to go. Yeah. It will, though. That is the guarantee. Here's the thing. There is a formula for wholeness, and it's vulnerability when met with empathy equals Mm -hmm. wholeness. And so I think as artists, when we are vulnerable, our people meet that with empathy because they're like, oh, my gosh, me too. Right. You know, and, and so oh my then gosh, we, she's real. She's a human. Yes. They and then see we that. all get to experience healing in that right. moment. And then you, you've been courageous and being able to share your story. And that brings someone out because it requires energy to hold back our stories. And, you know, I, I understand you're probably not holding it back with those intimate with you in your life. But as a public person, there is a whole nother level of then 
expressing vulnerability on a public level that I think can be just as healing as expressing it in that intimate level, as long as you're expressing it on the intimate level too. I think it's challenging if a public person is being vulnerable on stage, but then doesn't have any real life people, you know? You seem like a real life people kind of person. Absolutely. I, I, I can't really live any other way. That's why uh, kind of keeping it in the shadows is really hard for me. Once again, not to be shameful, but like you said, telling your story is not shameful. That's not the intent, right? And it's all about the heart. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, yes to everything you just said. It's huge encouragement to me, which I didn't jump on here to to necessarily take that away, but I'm, I'm very grateful too. Um, but you're right. I, I want to stand on the stage and be able to, you know, I'm a storyteller. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what my show is. It's me making uh, real situations hilarious, laughing at myself, at people I've dated, you know, at mm-hmm. shameful situations. My goal is not to laugh at anybody else's shameful situation, but I do want to take the hard things of life and let people know, hey, it's okay. You're not going to, mm-hmm. you're not going to die in this hole. You know, mm-hmm. let's make it light. Let's walk through it together. Let's get through it. Yeah. That's the goal. So, um, yeah, speaking out of real life experience, it's what it's about. It is. It is. Okay. So I want to know what prompted you to post your first video? Like, was it like you dropped your kids off at school, you pulled over to the side and you whipped it out? Right. Or was it like you had a little bit in your mind that you'd been contemplating for a couple months and you finally just did it? Like what? Tell me the story behind I ain't doing it. <laughs> it's so dumb. I, so I have a few uh, equally ridiculous friends, quite a few actually, but a few in particular that, you know, we would send. So my kids Snapchat, right? And I'm like, let's just see what this Snapchat's all about. How old are your um, kids again? My son's 16. My daughter's 12. Okay. Okay. Yep. Seventh grade and 11th grade. Um, so I got on Snapchat and just found the ugliest, dumbest filter I could find and um, was just making these stupid videos, sending them to friends, just a couple of good friends, like on a group text, which I hate group text, but whatever. So they were just like, you're a moron, but these are, these are hilarious. Please post them on social media. At the time I was single. So I was like, heck no, like I'm single. I don't want to be that way forever. This is not the way you want to throw yourself out there. Okay. With the filter face. Um, but finally on a dare, I just I put one up and yeah, people started watching it and saying, Oh, we love your, I ain't doing it video. And Jessica, I did not even know that I said, I ain't doing it. It was the <laughs> most unintentional thing I've ever done. Um, but you know, they said, Hey, can you make more? I ain't doing it videos. And, uh, so that's where the shtick came from, but it was, uh, never something that I set out to do, but I think it resonates because we all get annoyed and frustrated and we all have those friends that we either send the videos to, or we make the comments to Definitely, Uh, mine just happened to be on social media. And I think they've become a voice for people who, you know, want to say the same thing, but maybe don't feel like they have the guts. Right. Um, right. So yeah, it just caught on and here we are on your podcast. So did you, were you doing stand up before this or is this what launched your career into oh, stand up? No, no, this is, this is what sent me in that direction. I, so I was a worship leader for about 20 years. Um, so standing up in front of people was never a strain for me. It was, uh, I mean, I have definitely had my, you know, nervous moments, but um, I, I'm a people person. I absolutely love uh, getting to know people. So that was that was a a good introduction into comedy, but uh, I was doing refinancing. I had gone through a divorce. I had a really good friend who gave me a job to help me get stable, and I was just sitting at my desk refinancing when this thing went crazy. And people were just coming out of the woodwork, emailing, messaging, uh, wanting me to come and do comedy. And I'm just I was telling a friend of mine, I don't do comedy, and she's like, Well, then you know, you can just keep working at your desk job, which is not what, you know, you ultimately want, you know, to be doing, um, even though it was a wonderful place. But yeah, so I just had to make that choice. Do I want to give it a go and do stand up? And, you know, my friend encouraged me like, hey, all you're doing is what you're doing now. You're just being yourself. You're just doing it with a microphone in your hand. Wow. And I was like, okay. And what year was this? This was, uh, well, September 2017. Wow. Was when the fan page went up. And then uh, my first comedy set was in October 
uh, wow. at a church of a friend of mine, and I cried my eyes out when it was over. Oh, uh, my gosh. Yeah, okay, yeah. Me. So you're going from sitting there, you know, having just finished a divorce, refinancing, probably in the middle of just recovering from a very hard process. Totally. And now you are writing comedic writing and then performing it for the first time. <laughs> like, yes. What was your process to go from like po- doing a little Snapchat video to then right. actually having to do a show and keep people laughing? Well, when you were just saying it, I literally had knots in my stomach thinking, yeah, I don't <laughs> remember awful. how. That sounds horrible. horrible. That sounds terrible. Who would have to do that? <laughs> um, yeah, I had a really good friend who just um, sat down with me and she was like, okay, you know what we're going to do? We're going to comb over these videos. And, uh, you know, you wrote them. She said, she said, you wrote them. So, uh, let's pull out funny bits and write more about these ridiculous subjects. And so that's what we did. And I went from, you know, barely being able to speak for 10 minutes to uh, a two hour comedy set to where I'm having to say, Hey, can you ask this venue if we can go just a little bit longer? You know, it's just been quite the unfolding. And even wow. as I'm saying it, just, uh, I still don't really know, um, how, but it's just been very divine, I think. And wow. the path that I was supposed to take. And, yeah. uh, the great thing about it is I kind of had nothing to do with it. I was just forced into it and yeah. had to make a yeah. choice. And I kind of prefer it that way. You know, I know that, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't self-made really. People think it was, but it wasn't, you know, there are uh, much higher powers out there who, uh, you know, had something in mind for me and uh, I'm grateful. Okay. So let's, let's talk about some, I ain't doing it. So this week uh, we have about 60 employees at our noonday collection office, about 95% women. And then I would say about, I don't know, 20 to 30% of those, maybe 30 more are working moms. So we, it is back to school. Okay. We've got, and all the kids are at different schools starting different times. We are like having to punt meetings. We're like, no, I, I have to go to like the ice cream social. Um, I've got to go to this, like meet the teacher. Nope. Now I have to go to this pep rally and, oh, I have to go go to the meet the moms thing. And we're all coming back into the office. Like, okay, sorry, I'm late. I just had to do this school thing. And we're all like right. hating it, that moment yeah. of when yeah. you walk. So my moment this week was like walking into the gym and it's the pep rally. And I I am so uninvolved in my kid's school. This time last year, I was launching a book. The time year before that, writing a book. The time before that, we didn't have half the employees we have now. So I was like in the weeds with the business. Right. So this, this, I have more margin this fall for school. And so I even put on my calendar, I'm like pick, doing a lot of school pickups this year. And um, I, I even showed up at the kid's school this week and a teacher wow. said, sh- the school, the teacher said, you're here. <laughs> you're alive. You do You're here. You came. I was <laughs> like, are you like already trying to dig? like shame me? Like, come on. <laughs> but anyway, and so we're all lamenting about these things that we do as moms that we all kind of hate. But if we all hate them, but we still do them. So let's talk about some of your I ain't doing it. That like, what are some of those things that you just don't do when it comes to back to school? Oh, gosh. Well, first of all, I really love your honesty about, you know, your your lack of involvement. Uh, I think that that's that's the key is being able to say, you know what? Like, I'm not bringing cupcakes. Like, sign Mm -hmm. me up for napkins. Like, that's my limit this week. I think that, you know, for me, uh, I have to know my limits and my limits are. um they stop when I send you on the bus. Like (laughs) that's where I'm at this year. Like we went from homeschooling the past two years to now school and I'm giving myself a lot of grace. I'm just like, I'm going to get you on the bus. I'm going to get you home. I'm going to feed you. I'm going to put money in that lunch account if I remember. And that's maybe the best I can do. I'm going to check your grades online uh, because I actually figured out how to do that. Mm, But as far as anything else goes, I just have to really know my boundaries and my limits, because here's the truth. My kids are fine. They don't need that from me. It doesn't make me less of a mom or better of a mom if I'm more involved or less involved. So the only reason, if I'm being honest, that I would really be uber involved is number one, if I loved it, which I don't. Mm -hmm. And number two, so I could appear to have it all together in front of the school and the other moms. Also Mm -hmm. don't care about that. 
So Mm -hmm. I've had to just really get honest and say, it's okay that I don't like to be a room mom. It's okay that I don't want to go on a field trip anymore. Uh, It's okay. I know what kind of mom I am. And I, I just think that our schools are full of moms who are trying to prove it. And mm. we don't have to do that. You got a couple of people to prove it to, and it's the ones getting off the bus in the afternoons, right? Uh, if, I feel like if we're doing the work at home, um, you know, like my kids, I don't, I just don't think they're going to grow up scarred if, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, if I didn't remember whatever to send their lunch one day, whatever. I just, they're going to make it, right? Yeah. So I think we it's- have to get in that space as moms. I'm curious your journey, because if you went from homeschooling, like what was the narrative of homeschooling, I would think is very different than the narrative you just said now, which is like, I don't have anything to prove. What sort of helped you to get to that? I don't have anything to prove mentality. I think I got there by trying to prove. Mm, (laughs) I think mm. I got to that point because I hit a limit where I was just trying to be all things to all people. And I couldn't do it anymore, you know? So, uh, you know, also let me just tell you homeschool in my house. Oh, good grief. I can't even really go into it because I've made it a comedy bit. Okay. It's a joke. (laughs) I'm serious. Like I was the worst homeschool mom in the history of homeschool moms. So what does that look like? What does that, what does it look like to be the worst? It looks like, or what grade are you in even? Like, my have kids? you done work? Yeah. Have oh, you done oh, work oh, in to three your months? Kids. Your kids. Yeah, to my kids. I'm just like, what? what's going on? Like, wh- do you work? Because I'm doing dishes and, and writing. So where are you at with your life? <laughs> that's, uh-huh. that's when you know you, it's time to let somebody else take the wheel. Um, I love teachers. Like, I, I'm just like, whatever you want to do, whatever. It's fine. It's, it's fine. Just can you take the weight? Can you take the weight off of me? Um, yeah, I think I just got to a point where I realized my boundaries, my limits uh, as a human, and I, I just couldn't do it anymore. They went to tutorials for a while. Um, that worked for a little bit, and then they kind of, it didn't. And then we did online, and that worked for a while, and then it didn't. And, uh, you know, it's just moment by moment, season by season. You know, what works for one family at one time doesn't work for another. So just kind of navigating it. So this is, I mean, this has happened quick. I mean, I have to admit, even Noonday got onto like Inc.'s fastest growing company in the nation. So that was a few years ago, but I remember kind of the insanity of that, like Mm -hmm. suddenly you are, yeah, like this is what I'm doing. I mean, so I I can really relate to your story, but you're at the very beginning. I'm nine years in. Um, What what are you wanting for the next couple of years? Uh, That's a great question. I think if I could give a really annoying, uh, vague answer, it would be my biggest goal. It's the truth though. I just want to continue connecting with people. Uh, that's what I love about the road. Mm -hmm. I love being with people. I draw so much energy from it, um, from encouraging them and then receiving the encouragement back, you know? Um, so that's, big goals, you know, that's the, that's the, you know, that's the over the top. That's everything I want. As Mm. far as the small things, um, like I said, I I really hope I can really dig deep and write that third book about real life and, uh, Mm. just kind of what's happened. Um, I definitely want to stay on the road. I love doing stand up. It's wonderful. Uh, I would love to do a podcast myself and see, you know, if that's something um, that flies. Yeah. And I want to, um, somehow manage a life in there as well, um, which Mm. so far I'm I'm able to do. So it's going pretty well. Um, yeah, I just want to keep doing what I'm doing, uh, until I don't want to keep doing it. So I don't Mm -hmm. know when that day comes, is that going to be 10 years, five years? I don't know. Uh, but I know that I'm loving where I'm at and just want to keep, uh, plugging along. That's good. That's good. So how would you say you're going scared right now? Like when you think back to that moment of doing that first comedic stand up and you just wanted to throw up and you cried afterwards, has some, have some of those things gotten easier? And then what are the things that are still causing you to want to throw up? Mm. Um, I think the normal fears of being a business owner 
are that, that those make me want to throw up. Like, mm. am I going to make it? Am I going to, you know, uh, those things it's, I've kind of switched gears from stand up making me want to throw up to just kind of real life making me nervous. But, um, as far as stand up goes, you know, I think the way I got to the point of being able to enjoy it is, uh, I just had to drink a healthy dose of getting over myself. Mm. Um, that's probably been the biggest thing. I just have had to say, you know what? It's okay. If they laugh, they laugh. If they don't, they don't. You got to know who you are when you get on that stage. And you have to remember that all you're doing is standing on the stage, having a cup of coffee with some friends. And that has really helped me be more relaxed on the platform Mm. and help me enjoy it. Um, just not self-deprecating, uh, definitely self-deprecating on the stage. <laughs> but when I get off the stage, just leaving it there, you know, and going, yeah. you know what? It's okay. Either that was a, that bombed or gosh, that was probably the best set I've ever done. I have those nights all the time. Um, I think holding it loosely is the key. Uh, remembering why I'm there. Uh, yeah. And so I think the nausea, you know, it, it uh, ebbs and flows into other areas now. Um, yeah. <laughs> now I'm just hoping my son can pass French. That makes me nauseous. Oh, um, yeah. Things like Oof. that. Yeah. Oof. French, yeah. French you know, is once we once we master one thing, then we we move on to worrying about the it's, next, right? It's true, but that's what's so important. I think about getting outside your comfort zone, which you never would have been where you are today if you wouldn't have gotten on that stage in spite of your. Fear. And I think we all, we're our worst critic. I record, I forgot that I had voice memo to talk I gave a couple of months ago and I hadn't spent a ton of time prepping for it. And I was just kind of like, I'm going to record myself. I'm going to see how I sound on this one. <laughs> right. um, and I found it yesterday on my voice memo. And I remember the time like doing a little joke and I remember thinking, well, that didn't land. Like I, I didn't hear one laugh. And then I was listening to the voice memo yesterday and people were dying of laughter. Wow. And I was like, oh my gosh, I remembered it differently. And mm. it's just interesting, interesting how we tend to remember things more in the negative light a lot of times. Um, and so I think that's such a good practice is someone who does get on stage or in any way is a performer, an artist. Um, you put yourself out there and you can't ultimately you can you can't influence you can influence an outcome, but you can't control it. And right. so I That's think right. there has to be that. It's that riding the wave, you know? Like our job is to learn our skill and practice and get that six pack that's going to keep us up. But right. we are not the power, right? The wave is the right. power. Well, and I think another important piece of that puzzle is, you know, we're so quick to latch on to that one negative comment and not even look at the 200 good ones. Right. And I think that's important is to, you know, recognize which voices you're going to give power to. Um, Absolutely. That's been a, that's been a huge just lesson for me is, you know, there might be a few people that tell me I'm stupid and you need to get off the internet. Um, But there's 200 people that say, um, thanks for getting me through, you know, uh, cancer or, the death of my family member or whatever. And I think those voices obviously are more important. I really loved that question that she challenged us to at the end. What voices are you going to give power to? The thing is we get to choose. We get to choose who's in our feeds. We get to choose what mom is going to make us feel like lesser than a mom this year. Um, Something I've been teaching my kids and they've been throwing this right back at at me is this old Chuck Swindoll quote. And it says that 5% of life is what happens to you. And 95% of life is how you respond to it. And (laughs) this summer when my kids were like, I'm so annoyed. You're annoying me. You're annoying me. And I would say, no, what they're doing is not annoying. You are choosing to react to that. You are choosing to be annoyed by them. Yeah, I've been using that medicine on me, but as we're going into this school year where it's so easy to go into that prove yourself mode and, you know, what do you want this teacher to think and that and that mom at school drop off or if you don't show up for that meeting, 
What if you decide, just decided what, what voices do you want to give power to this year and write those down? And then what voices do you not want to give power to? I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. If you did go on, leave a review. I'm not trying to beat the dead horse, but it really does help this podcast, especially as we have relaunched our new series. I deeply appreciate you spending time with me today. I love being in your earbuds, whatever you might be doing at this moment. Our wonderful music for today's show is by my good friend, Ellie Holcomb. Going Scared is produced by Eddie Kohlholtz, and I'm Jessica Honiger. Until next time, let's take each other by the hand and keep going scared. Scared.